everybody. Happy to be here. Happy to be talking about gardening um, on this overcast February day here in, in Fayetteville. Um, so while Sarah's pulling up the, the slides, uh, just briefly talk about um, who I am. I'm a horticulture specialist with NCAT, the National Center for Appropriate Technology, which is a national nonprofit that does sustainable agricultural training for small farmers throughout the country, but we have a regional office here in Fayetteville. And our office um, historically served as um, a host for Arkansas Food Corps, and um, we do a lot of uh, farm to school outreach and education. Um, and we're, we're really happy to be engaged on this subject. Um, so today we're going to be talking um, about how to start a school garden at your school if you don't have a school garden already established. If you do, hopefully you'll learn some tips for maintaining your garden, um, maybe some new ideas for uh, management, you know, crops to plant, um, things like that. And um, we'll also be sharing some resources for you that will assist you with uh, crop planning and timing your planting um, as you move forward the season. Let's just get started with establishing your garden. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the first thing to think about if uh, you don't have a garden established at your school is where to put it, the location of the garden. And really the most important consideration here is sun exposure. Um, almost all garden crops, you know, vegetable and fruit crops need eight to 10 hours of sunlight a day at minimum. And especially at school sites with shade trees and buildings, um, it's very important that you ensure that your garden site actually gets that much sunlight. And so on this slide, you can see a graphic of, um, you know, where the sun is in the sky during different times of the year. So in the winter, it's going to be lower in the sky. In the summer, it's going to be higher in the sky, but it's always going to be on the, in the southern hemisphere relative to us, which means you want your garden site on the southern side of any buildings or shade trees, anything that's going to cast shade. You want to be to the south of that because that will ensure that your garden is getting full sun. Um, you know, one thing you can do is just when you get to the school in the morning, look to see where the shade is. In the middle of the day, look to see where shade is. And then before you leave at the end of the day, see, you know, what parts of the yard um, are in full sun or shade, and that can help you determine. Okay, next slide. Um, you know, in addition to the location, which, you know, another consideration for that, which I didn't mention, was um, access and being close to a water source. You definitely uh, want to make sure that watering your garden site is as easy as possible. You don't want to be dragging hoses, uh, you know, across the schoolyard to be able to water, water your garden in the summertime and then have to drag them back to put them away. So, you know, make sure that you have good access to water um, at the site you're considering. But then once you have a site chosen for your school garden, you want to think about are you going to be growing raised bed gardens or are your gardens going to be in ground? Um, and so with this, um, you know, there are some things to think about here. Most school gardens I've seen go with raised beds. They're a little easier to uh, put in place. You know, one of the drawbacks is that you need to purchase soil to place in them. Um, in ground gardens, you, you're just utilizing the soil you already have on site, but you know, to really do that well, uh, you need tractors or at least a good tiller to get those uh, beds established. Weeds are more of a problem if you're doing an in-ground garden bed because you're going to be dealing with weed seeds that are already present in the soil. Uh, weeds are much easier to manage in a raised bed garden. And also for kids, um, you know, if the garden's elevated a little bit, you know, it can be easier for them to reach in the garden. You're not having to bend over as much. Um, but I will say, um, you know, raised beds, you can just put in a few raised beds, see how they do. If they don't work out, you can always pull them out. Um, an in-ground garden is definitely more permanent, but if you have a lot of land and you really want to, to grow a large school garden, um, in-ground gardens definitely going to be more efficient, uh, use of your, your space and resources. Uh, next slide. Okay. So thinking about soil, soil is, um, 
maybe the second most important thing when it comes to gardening. You need sunlight and you need good soil. Um, so usually at your at a school, the soil there on site is pretty poor, uh, which is another reason to go with raised beds because you get to choose what soil you grow in. Um, so if you're growing in a raised bed, I would recommend purchasing a commercial raised bed mix. Um, you can buy that bag at a place like Home Depot or Lowe's. You know, here in Northwest Arkansas, we have Nitron, which is an organic fertilizer company. They have a raised bed mix a lot of school gardens have used and had success with. If you want to make your own, I would mix uh, half topsoil with half compost, something around there. Um, the compost is going to give it more drainage and also provide organic matter and fertility. Um, most of those commercial raised bed mixes you find are going to be peat moss based, um, which essentially is, is similar to what you have in your, your potting mix for potted plants at home. For an in-ground garden, um, you definitely want to amend the soil with compost to improve soil quality, provide plant nutrients, um, and then mulch, like straw mulch. Um, for annuals, if you're doing perennials, wood chip mulch um, is a good way to improve your soil quality over time, add organic matter to the soil, and suppress weeds, um, with the exception of Bermuda grass, which, which we'll get to. Uh, mulch doesn't really work on Bermuda grass. And another thing to think about, you know, I've been talking about compost a lot. Uh, compost can definitely provide some, some good foundational uh, base level nutrients, establish good soil fertility um, to begin with, but you'll probably need to be uh, adding fertilizer um, seasonally. Um, you know, supplementing with a liquid fertilizer, adding some kind of granular fertilizer in the spring um, before you plant your crop. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Some people think, oh, I added compost, I'm good, but um, compost doesn't always cut it. All right, next slide. Okay, so water. Um, I mentioned when you're thinking about your site, making sure you have access to your water source, that's really important. But then think about how you're actually gonna water your crops. Um, I would recommend thinking about setting up an irrigation system. It doesn't have to be complicated. If you're growing in raised beds, you could do something as simple as some soaker hose uh, um, with a timer so that you can you know, set the timer for an hour, two hours, let the soaker hose um, water the bed, and then you know, just check on it before you leave for the day to make sure it actually shut off. Um, you know, especially in the summertime when you're going to be watering once a day or once every other day, um, you really want to make this as easy as possible for you. Um, you know, another option when it comes to, to watering systems, irrigation systems is drip tape, uh, which you can see in this slide, it's the bottom right. Um, so drip tape is, is similar to soaker hose, except um, it has smaller emitters that are spaced out six, eight, 12 inches, which are just gonna trickle. Um, like, like the name uh, says, it's just gonna drip water. It's a very efficient way to water your crops, but it only works if you have straight rows. Uh, soaker hose is great because you can snake that soaker hose around your plants in the bed and, and you don't have to have perfectly straight rows for that soaker hose to work. Um, and with soaker hose, it doesn't have to be on as long because there are a lot of holes and the water's gonna come out a lot faster. Um, mulch is also a really good way to conserve soil moisture. So I mentioned before using straw mulch as weed control. Um, the straw mulch is also gonna help keep that moisture in the soil, keep the soil from drying out which is really important for summer gardening, especially if you're gonna have crops growing through the summertime during summer break, uh, making sure you mulch your bed so the soil doesn't dry out as quickly. Um, which if you're using some kind of commercial raised bed mix that's uh, peat moss based, it's gonna be very light. It's gonna dry out really quickly. It's gonna have good drainage. So you, you definitely wanna mulch those beds. All right, next slide. Okay, so weeds. Um, <laughs> everyone's favorite gardening subject. Um, and I, I would be remiss if I don't mention Bermuda grass here. If any of you have done any gardening in Arkansas or anywhere in the South, you're very familiar with Bermuda grass. Um, you probably have nightmares about Bermuda grass. Um, it's the worst weed of all time. So I, I bring it up because 
Bermuda grass can take over school garden beds and you really want to plan ahead for it. Um, this weed is absolutely terrible if it grows into your raised beds. Um, I mean, it's enough to have to just kind of scrap a bed and start over from scratch. Um, and the reason why it's such a terrible weed is that it grows these rhizomes, which you can see in the photo on the right, um, it, which are kind of like underground stems and it can grow those rhizomes up to five feet. Uh, it can grow under a weed barrier and pop out the other end. Um, and so, you know, if you're, you're putting in raised beds, and you don't have a good weed barrier underneath that raised bed, if you have Bermuda grass around the bed, it's gonna end up in your bed because of those rhizomes growing under your raised bed frame and then growing into your bed. Um, the solens are the, the stems that grow horizontally over the, the sur surface of the soil, um, which you can see in that photo in the middle. And they could actually grow above ground over your raised bed frame and into your bed. Uh, so I'll give you some strategies for preventing Bermuda from taking over your garden beds. Next slide. Yeah, so weed barrier is um, really my favorite preventative weed control. Um, any, anyone who's putting in a, a raised bed, uh, I highly recommend they put down weed barrier under the raised bed to keep weeds from growing up into their bed. So there are different types of weed barrier. What I would recommend is called landscape fabric, which is a more uh, long-term, heavy-duty woven uh, material that um, will prevent weeds like Bermuda grass from growing up into your bed. Um, people have had success with cardboard, layering a bunch of cardboard and or newspaper, um, but that'll break down over time and eventually weeds like Bermuda grass or Johnson grass can grow up through that. Um, you know, if you have the money for it, I would recommend buying a roll of landscape fabric and using that. So I have some photos here. Um, the, the middle one and the bottom, um, you know, shows school garden here in the state where they've essentially put down weed barrier over the garden site, put their raised beds on top of that, uh, filled the raised beds with, you know, some kind of, um, you know, container mix, and then um, have wood chip mulch in the walkway. Um, and the photo on the right, you can see that in progress. That's a really great way to establish a garden site because it means you don't have to weed it, you don't have to mow it, um, and you have that weed barrier down that keeps weeds from growing up into your beds. Um, so the only weeds you'd end up with in your beds are, are weeds that blow in, um, weed seeds that, that blow in the wind. Um, next slide. Okay, but inevitably, inevitably you're going to get weeds in your bed, so you need to know how to deal with them. Um, so, you know, the most important thing to, to take from this is to get them when they're small. Um, it's so much easier to weed uh, weeds that are seedlings than, you know, larger established weeds that you have to pull out or chop out. Um, so you can see in the slide you know, that circle photo, those tiny little weed seedlings, that's when it's time to weed. That's when it's time to take out the hoe, get the kids with the little hand hose and just scratch up those weeds, disturb the soil, especially on a, on a dry, windy, sunny day. It won't take you very long. Um, that's when you need a weed. Um, but of course, you know, things don't always work out perfectly. Um, and you might end up pulling out more established weeds. And when you do that, just be sure to, to try to pull up most of the root system, um, especially if it's a perennial weed, it's gonna grow up from the root system, like a, a dandelion or, or Bermuda grass or Johnson grass or something like that, or dock, it's gonna grow up from the root system. So try to get it all out. Okay, so um, next section is when to plant. Um, you know, exactly when you can plant, depends a lot on where you are in the state, which determines your, your last frost date in the spring. Some of you might be aware of, um, you know, the concepts of, of hardiness zones and frost dates. Um, if you're not aware, um, I, I listed some of the, the last spring freeze dates for, you know, different areas where some of you are located, uh, where your schools are. So, you know, here in Fayetteville, 
Um, the average last freeze date, so this would be on average the last date where it gets 32 or below, would be April 8th. Um, in Jonesboro, it's April 4th. Little Rock, it's March 20th. Um, so the idea is that after this date, um, it, is, it is safe to, to start planting um, spring crops that can tolerate cold. Um, and in addition to freeze date, you can also look up a frost free date. You know, the frost would technically be when it gets 36 or below. So after the last average frost date, that would be when you can safely uh, plant summer crops like tomatoes, peppers, basil. Um, though you might have to have row cover ready to, to cover it if it gets cold, because these are average dates, these are not predictive. But that gets you some idea of when you can get started. Um, so um, the first freeze in the fall is another date to consider. Uh, if you're planting fall crops, you're going to be taking that number and planting back from that. Um, but a lot of the planting recommendations you'll see will say to, you can plant this you know, two to three weeks before your last average frost date in the spring or you can safely plant after your last average frost date. So uh, those are some numbers for your reference. All right, next slide. Uh, but, but looking at what specific date you can actually plant a specific crop. Um, you know, if you're gardening in the fall, what you can look at is um, counting back from the last average frost date in the fall and looking at the, the days to maturity for that crop. So for example, looking at lettuce in the fall, um, you know, here in Northwest Arkansas, our last average or first average frost date in the fall is October 15th. And so for, for lettuce, if we're looking at a lettuce that has 28 days to maturity, uh, so that's how many days from planting it to harvesting it, um, then I could, I could do some math to figure out when I would plant it in the fall. So I'd look at October 15th minus 28 days. So that would be September 17th would be the latest I'd want to plant that lettuce to get it harvested before my last average frost date. Now there are ways I could protect that lettuce uh, with some row cover or a low tunnel or something like that. But at least that gives you um, kind of a reference point to calculate planting dates in the fall. You know, for the spring, it's more based on when your last average spring frost date is. And this is a good way to incorporate math, you know, into the, the school garden uh, curriculum, like we were talking about integrating different uh, subjects. This is a great way to, to talk about math with the students. All right, next slide, Sarah. Um, okay, so, so to help you guys with all this, um, I actually created this uh, planting calendar for school gardens, um, which, Sarah's gonna make sure you have access to. Uh, I gave her some PDFs to, to pass along. Uh, so what you can see on the left, I have a handout that actually kind of graphically shows you what spring crops you can be planting in your school garden and when they can be planted uh, outside, but also if you're starting them indoors, when they can be planted indoors. Um, so I'm just pulling it up on my screen. Um, so for example, if you're looking at spring crops um, and you're looking at, okay, which ones can be harvested by mid-May? Um, you can see that I color coded it. So those green bars are the harvest windows for these crops. So if you look at it, lettuce is gonna be harvested by early May, peas, spinach, onions, kale, radishes, Swiss chard, turnips, Maybe, maybe you could harvest some beets before the kids get out. Uh, so that it gives you a good idea of what crops you can actually pull out of the garden before the end of the semester, the end of the school year. And then if you look at that red bar, it gives you a planting window. And so, you know, you can see here we're in late February. You could already be planting your peas and spinach in the garden. Uh, you can start your broccoli, cabbage, and lettuce indoors. And then starting in March, you can plant most of these spring crops in your garden. Um, 
and then by, by mid-March, you can be planting your beets, potatoes, Swiss chard, and turnips. And so I um, wanted to include this resource because I think this, this will help you, you know, quickly figure out what, what you can be planting, when you can be planting it. As you can see in the slide, there's a more detailed version of the, the planting schedule, with get, which gives you actual dates. Um, and average days to maturity, you know, if you're starting it indoors, it tells you how much time it takes you to grow that plant indoors before you can plant it out in the garden. Uh, so these will serve as a handy resource for you. All right, next slide. And when it comes to planting seeds in the garden, uh, you know, it's really as easy as one, two, three, if you get the timing right. Uh, you know, first just, you know, digging a trench or making the hole to plant the seed at the proper depth, which that seed packet's going to tell you. Um, you know, secondly, getting the spacing right between each seed. And again, that information will be on your seed packet, or there are some books that I'm going to reference, which will also give you the seed spacing for different crops. And three, it's burying the seed um, with soil. Uh, four would be to water it, unless the soil is already moist. Um, but, you know, watering those seeds in is the last step. Um, so on the slide, I have, you know, some things you need to know before you plant, when to plant, uh, the temperature, both soil temperature and air temperature. But if you go by that seed planting calendar, um, you know, it'll make sure that it's the right time of year. Depth, spacing. And then some seeds, instead of planting in a row, you can broadcast, which is kind of spreading either in a band or you could broadcast throughout the bed. Things like a salad mix, which you're going to cut. You could cut it with scissors or with a harvest knife, kind of cut and then let it grow and cut it again or cut and come again, as farmers would say. Um, so that's another option for planting. But most seeds, you know, it's going to give you a row spacing uh, with spacing between the rows and between the seeds. All right, next slide. Um, but, you know, as I pointed out, some crops can be started indoors. Um, some are optional and some should be started indoors. So like your, your broccoli or cabbage for the spring, you just don't have enough time in the spring to plant those seeds directly in your garden and produce a head of broccoli or cabbage before it gets too hot. So those crops, for example, in the spring, you're going to either need to buy transplants from a nursery or start seeds indoors. And when it comes to starting seeds indoors, it's, you know, it's very simple. Sarah was showing me she started some basil in a mason jar in her window. Um, <laughs> she's going to show you all. Um, so some supplies you need for starting seeds indoors, some potting soil. Um, get, I would get a seed starting mix or basic potting mix. You know, containers, ideally containers with holes in the bottom for drainage. Um, the most important thing here, or at least the thing that I feel like is neglected most, is light. And so the light source, it can be, you know, a, a south-facing window can work because it gets more sun exposure. Um, in addition to that, you might need some grow lights. Um, grow lights by themselves can work as long as you have enough and they're bright enough. Um, or maybe you have a greenhouse you have access to, that would be ideal. Um, you know, watering periodically when the soil dries out. I see people uh, overwatering pretty often when it comes to starting seeds, and that can cause problems. You need the right temperature inside, uh, but room temperature should work for most of your, your garden crops, starting them inside. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, when you're germinating the seeds, is to, you know, right after you plant the seeds in the soil, they need warm soil to germinate. You know, usually it's between 75 and 85 degrees. So putting them in a warm spot so that soil warms up uh, before the seeds sprout. Once the seeds sprout for your spring crops, you can move them into a cooler location between 65 and 75 degrees. And then once they start growing, especially uh, larger transplants like broccoli or cabbage, you'll need to provide some nutrients with fertilizer. And there are a lot of liquid fertilizers you can, you can buy, some organic um, that are pretty common at uh, like a Home Depot or Lowe's. Next slide. Okay, so transplanting just refers to planting uh, those plants outside. Um, and so this would, you'd need to transplant if you started uh, seedlings inside in a greenhouse or 
in a classroom. And usually it's four to eight weeks from planting that, that seed indoors to transplanting it outside. Uh, in, in that uh, more detailed planting calendar I gave you, it gave you the number of weeks from seed to transplant um, for transplanted crops. One thing to keep in mind is those plants need to be hardened off, which is just a process of gradually exposing them to cooler temperatures that they'll experience outside, wind that they'll experience outside, kind of just getting them ready for the environmental stress they'll experience. They're used to being inside and coddled and nurtured and you know watered every day and they're about to enter the harsh world. So about over a week, you know, gradually exposing them to outdoor conditions is how you harden off seedlings. Um, and then you have to think about the spacing um, of transplants, uh, watering them in with fertilizer, make, making sure there's plenty of fertilizer in your soil, good fertility in your soil, I should say. Um, and especially if there are summer crops, putting some mulch around them to keep the weeds down uh, is, is important. Next slide. Okay, and then there's a topic of succession planting, which is the idea of instead of planting everything all at once, so maybe you're planting radishes, uh, you know, here coming up in the next few weeks, instead of planting all your radishes at once, you could plant a little bit of radishes uh, kind of one week at a time in batches, so you don't harvest them all at once and you harvest them over uh, a greater span of time. We actually have a, an ATRA resource uh, so ATRA is a program uh, run by NCAT, the organization I work for. It's our sustainable agriculture program. So we have an ATRA resource on succession planting, which uh, I'll provide to you, which gives you the, the number of weeks between planting different crops if you want to plant in successions so you're not harvesting everything all at once. Next slide. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little more about what to plant in your garden. And what I would say here is consider the harvest dates. You know, like Richard mentioned, him wanting to harvest spring crops before mid-May, uh, before the kids get out. Um, you know, it's really important to look at that table and see when you'd be harvesting your crop to determine what you can grow um, to harvest in time. All right, next slide. Okay, so here I kind of divided out vegetable crops um, between ones that are easy for beginners if you're just getting started with a school garden, and then on the next slide, I'll include some vegetables that are a little more difficult. Um, so, you know, for spring crops, easy to grow, easy success, beets, lettuce, peas, potatoes, kale, radishes, Swiss chard, and turnips. Um, of these, radishes are by far the easiest. Lettuce is pretty dang easy. Uh, turnips as well, though. Um, it'd be great if you could get your kids to love turnips. Maybe you can. <laughs> They're not everybody's favorite. Um, but, you know, for sure, lettuce and radishes um, are by far the easiest spring crops to go, grow, and you can definitely get those harvested before mid-May. Um, for your summer crops, cucumbers, beans, okra, chili peppers, and jalapenos, you know, fairly easy. Um, next slide. And then some crops that are a little more advanced in the spring, um, so carrots are a little tricky. It just takes them a long time to germinate. Um, they grow very slowly at the beginning. So you need to make sure that you keep them well weeded. Cabbage and broccoli uh, can have problems too. Um, if you plant them too late or it gets too hot in the spring, they can tend to bolt or flower on you. Um, and then in the summer, um, you know, corn can be difficult. It requires a lot of fertilizer, squash, Squash bugs, if any of you are gardeners, you know, you know squash bugs very well. Eggplant, there are flea beetles uh, and peppers and tomatoes. Um, just because it, it takes them a long time to actually produce fruit, um, there are a lot of things that can go, can go wrong, not to necessarily discourage you from them, but um, just to show you there are some crops that are, you know, easy to have success with and other ones. Don't be disappointed if, you know, your first time it doesn't turn out that well. And then vining crops like watermelon and pumpkins, they also just take a really long time to mature the fruit. And, um, you know, with pumpkins, squash bugs can be a big problem. Um, but yeah, like I said, I don't want to discourage you from growing these crops, but just realize they're, they're going to be a little more difficult. Next slide. 
And then, you know, if you're interested in growing fruit for school gardens, um, that's fantastic. Kids love fruit. Everyone loves fruit crops. But uh, fruit's definitely trickier to grow than vegetable crops. When it comes to fruit, an easy thing to start with are strawberries. I will uh, note that strawberries are planted in the fall in mid-September here in Arkansas. Uh, you know, some people plant the strawberries in the spring and they'll be disappointed that they don't get many berries. That's that's because they do best when they're planted in the fall. So something you can think about for next fall. Blackberries, if you have enough space for blackberries, blackberries are very easy to grow here in Arkansas. And growing thornless varieties like Washita or Natchez um, is the way to go. Definitely avoid thorny varieties for ease of harvest. And then some less common fruits that do really well are mulberries, pawpaws, figs, and persimmons. Uh, but when it comes to anything perennial, you're, you're gonna have to learn a lot about crop care throughout the whole year. Uh, pruning tree crops like mulberries, pawpaws, um, and persimmons. Uh, but these are some that if you're curious, you could try out. Next slide. And uh, not to be a Debbie Downer, but uh, tree fruits like pears, apples, peaches are, are extremely difficult to grow here in Arkansas because of diseases and pests. Uh, so unless you're experienced growing these crops, I would recommend you, you steer away, try out the, the ones I had in the previous slide first, if you wanna grow some fruit for your school gardens. Next slide. Um, and then having herbs in the garden is fantastic. And especially if you're doing a lot of cooking classes, cooking demonstrations, having culinary herbs like basil, chives, cilantro, dill, parsley, uh, maybe doing a salsa garden with tomatoes, peppers, cilantro, onions would be really fun for the kids. Um, some perennial herbs, uh, like having a perennial herb bed for perennials like oregano, rosemary, sage. I'm sorry, oregano is not uh, perennial. Um, anyway, rosemary, sage, thyme, mint, um, put that under the perennial category uh, in a perennial herb bed would be fantastic. And teaching kids about cooking and, and growing herbs. Next slide. Um, okay, and so flowers, um, something you not, might not have thought about for your school garden, but this is fantastic. Uh, for kids to, to kind of see the, the options with gardening, it's not all, you know, vegetables. Um, they could harvest bouquets for their, for their parents, maybe a bouquet. Um, you know, to take home to mom uh, if you have a school garden program for the summer. Um, so some, some great annual flowers, zinnias, sunflowers, uh, cosmos. Uh, these are gardens we grow in our garden here um, at our place every year. They're, you know, pretty easy to grow, uh, pretty low maintenance. Um, and if you want to experiment with some native perennials, Echinacea, Black-Eyed Susan, Coreopsis are some, some really beautiful perennial native flowers that are great uh, habitat for butterflies and bees and other um, native pollinators. So some great education there on, on supporting pollinators, uh, providing pollinator habitat, and supporting beneficial insects. Next slide. Okay, and so lastly, uh, just briefly talking about crop planting, really it comes down to when and where you plant. Uh, and this is where, you know, looking over the, the crop planting sheets, the planting calendar I provided, you can think about when you're gonna be planting those crops. And then you just need to sit down with pencil and paper um, to look at where you're, you're planting your crops. Um, and that just depends on you know, how many raised beds you have, if you're doing in-ground beds versus raised beds, what that layout is, what kind of space you have. Next slide. All right, so crops can be planted in rows. Um, most seed packets or, you know, garden books are going to tell you the row spacing, so how many inches between rows, uh, how many inches between plants in the rows. Um, but what I've seen practiced a lot at school gardens is doing more of the square foot gardening technique um, where you're actually creating a grid and you're, you're saying, so in this case, lettuce needs uh, a six inch square for each plant. So we're going to create a grid or measure it out and give uh, a six inch square for each lettuce plant. 
Um, so there, there are multiple ways to do, do things, but if you're interested in the square foot gardening uh, technique, there's a great book by Mel Bartholomew um, on square foot gardening, which has all the spacing. Next slide. Um, and then another thing you can think about is companion planting. This is a little more advanced, um, but you know it's just the concept that some crops do well planted close together. They're complementary. Um, in our garden in the spring, I like to plant lettuce and spinach on either side of our uh, sugar snap peas, which grow up on a trellis, and then the lettuce and spinach, you know, grows uh, lower to the ground. Uh, and they're, they grow well together. They don't really compete for space. Um, and there's a great book on the topic called Carrots Love Tomatoes, which has some recommendations for companion planting. Next slide. Uh, and then another idea, another concept when it comes to crop planting, thinking more long term, uh, several years out, is looking at crop families um, and rotating crops by crop families. Uh, so here as an example, you know, one year you could have lettuce, which is in the daisy family. The next year in the same bed, you could have tomatoes, which are in the nightshade family, then broccoli in the mustard family, then squash, which is in the gourd family. Um, so to help you with that, in that handout, the planting calendar handout, it shows the family for each crop in the table, um, which can help you create a rotation plan. This is not necessary, but if you can uh, create some kind of rotation, uh, that'll help prevent soil-borne diseases from building up um, and help, help keep your plants healthier. Next slide. And another thing to think about is planning for summer. Um, maybe there's not going to be anyone around to, to take care of the garden in the summertime. So, you know, think about, is there a way you can prevent weeds from growing up in your garden beds? Um, is there going to be anyone around to water your crops? Uh, you know, if you want to grow something, look at drought tolerant crops that, that don't need a lot of water, crops like sunflower, corn, okra, or sweet potatoes. Um, which can deal with the summer heat and don't need a lot of water. You'll still need to water them uh, occasionally though. Mulching your beds will help trap water, uh, trap moisture in the soil. Um, and summer cover crops are an option if you want something green but you don't want vegetable crops. Uh, cover crops are essentially plants that are grown for the soil and they're not grown to harvest. Um, so some summer cover crops you could grow in your garden are, are buckwheat, millet, Cow peas, sun hemp is another one. Um, you can look more into that if, if you're interested. But those are some ideas for the summertime. Next slide. And then there's season extension. So this is essentially stretching the growing calendar by protecting your plants from either um, temperatures, cold temperatures in the spring or fall frosts and freezing temperatures in the fall and winter time. Um, so season extension would include anything from row covers to low tunnels. Row covers are essentially frost blankets that are designed for agricultural use that you can cover your beds with, cover your seedlings with to protect them from temperatures, usually down to 28 is the amount of protection they'll provide. Low tunnels would be building some kind of structure, maybe bending PVC, hoops over your raised beds and then uh, stretching greenhouse plastic over that to create a, a little uh, greenhouse type structure over your raised beds to, to create warm temperatures um, to encourage more growth in the spring and protect them from freezing temperatures. Next slide. Um, and then high tunnels, if um, you, know, you, you have access to grant money or your school has money to, to put up a high tunnel, this is a great way to really extend that growing season for your school to be able to plant crops earlier in the spring, to harvest them later in the fall. Um, and, you know, in general, a high tunnel can provide about three weeks um, of season extension, both in the spring and fall. Um, and when I say high tunnel, I'm referring to something that, that doesn't have any kind of active heating. It doesn't have a furnace. Um, and it's, it's just passively heated by the sun. Next slide. 
you know, and then greenhouses, um, if you can put up a greenhouse for your school garden, it's a great way to start your own seeds, start transplants, you know, early in the year and in mid to late February, you could be starting seeds in a greenhouse. And then also it opens the, the door to growing plants year round um, with supplemental heat. Um, and here I have a, a photo from the Eureka Springs High School where they actually have a uh, high school greenhouse where they grow hydroponic lettuce uh, year round. Um, and so it, it presents a lot of fun things to do with your, your kids in the winter months if you have a greenhouse um, or you know, at minimum a great place for you to start your seedlings in the spring. Next slide. All right, so in summary, uh, you know, if you're just thinking about starting a school garden for your school, um, I would say start small and start smart. Think about how you're going to control your weeds, how you're going to water. Uh, you know, I would highly recommend using landscape fabric for weed control. Definitely start with easy to grow crops um, like the ones I mentioned so you can celebrate those successes and then build from that. Um, have an idea of when and where you're going to plant your crops. You know, try not to just absolutely wing it. I know when it comes to school garden programs, you're definitely having to kind of maybe make things up as you go or at least uh, improvise based on student interest or how things turn out. But if you can at least start the year with some kind of plan for what you're going to grow and where you're going to grow it, that's really going to help you have success that season. Uh, and then as the season progresses, definitely take notes. Uh, on what's doing well, maybe what insect pests you're encountering, ideas on how you can deal with that next year, what crop varieties are doing well for you, uh, what you want to grow more of next year, less of next year, you know, some ideas you have. Jot those down, have a garden journal where you record those notes uh, so you can refer to that next year when you're planning for your school garden. All right, well, that's it. I think I have a slide with resources right here. So some books I mentioned, Carrots Love Tomatoes, The Garden Primer by Barbara Damrosh is a fantastic book. Um, it really covers everything. Square foot gardening I mentioned if you're interested in doing that kind of spacing. And then this Vegetable Gardening in the Southeast by Ira Wallace is a newer book, but um, really good uh, book, uh, very relevant to our region. And then uh, I showed you some Atra publications. You can see more publications like those on our Atra website, atra.ncat.org. Uh, but also your Cooperative Extension Service is a fantastic resource and they have a lot of good resources on gardening and Arkansas Farm to School, like Sarah mentioned. Great. All right, well, I think. That was awesome, Luke. You gave us so much information about planting. Um, and, and I really appreciated too the thought that you put into of uh, what are some of those easier crops to grow just when teachers and educators have so much on their plate beyond just the school garden that you were really thoughtful in that and um, how you mentioned, you know, utilizing students as a, as a resource in all this by helping them figure out when plants should be seeded into the ground or having students brainstorm the best way to water their plants um, and to take care of the garden. So thank you so much for all of that. And um, like Luke said, I will be sending out all this information, the PowerPoint and the resources that he provided um, to everyone, but I want to just give some space for questions. I know that we for sure had a question um, earlier and it's in the Google Docs. I'm going to pull that up for us. And I also threw in two more questions just if, if you guys kind of are like me and you need a reflection piece at the very end to kind of capture a little bit of what you learned today. I put in a couple questions there that you can answer if that helps you think kind of next steps with your school garden. So. <clears throat> The questions we have for you, Luke, are you ready? And me, maybe. I'm ready. What is a good system for watering your plants using rain barrels? Well, that's fun. Um, yeah, rain barrels are a fantastic, uh, you know, way to, to be able to collect water that you catch on a rooftop. Um, so I would use rain barrels with soaker hose could work um, or drip tape. You need to make sure the rain barrel is elevated so that uh, gravity provides the pressure for that water to essentially move through the irrigation system. Uh, soaker hose would be easiest to set up. It's gonna 
go through that water quicker than drip tape. But like I mentioned, soaker hose, you can kind of snake it through your beds, um, snake it around plants. Um, just have, you know, some kind of on off valve. You can have a hose from your rain barrel to the bed and then have that hose plug into a soaker hose. And you should just be able to turn on the valve and water will come out of the soaker hose. But keep make sure that it's coming out the entire length of the soaker hose without a lot of pressure. It might just come out of the, the first bit, maybe the first few feet of soaker hose. And then um, it might not be coming out of the end. So I would monitor that with drip tape. It's probably going to be more likely to come out the entire length of the drip tape. Yeah. And I would also add to that I loved um, when working with kids in rain barrels was actually to use it more as like the opposite of efficiency um, because so many kids in one class if we if you just have one hose only one kid gets to participate in watering and so a rain barrel actually allows you to just turn the faucet on and then every kid can have a bucket or a cup or anything and just they all get to participate and now you have 25 kids that get to water an area um, so I've loved using a rain barrel in the ways that Luke expressed, but then also in sort of the inefficiency, um, like the, the best inefficiencies in gardens so all kids have an opportunity to participate. I just want to add that piece. Yeah. And then um, another question says, the high school at my site was just awarded a small grant for raised garden beds. Is it possible for them to attend one of these video webinars? I'm sure that's for me. So <laughs> yes, we've been recording this and um, I'm gonna share that out and it will be you know, all across social media and whatnot and on our website. Um, so yes, these will definitely be possible. We would love for students to attend these webinars. Um, and the time is not fixed. They can change from month to month. So you can look at the calendar and just sort of see um, if there's one of interest and in, uh, we'd be happy to kind of consider kids schedules around that. Um, and the next one that we're going to be actually having in March will be on March 31st at four. We're going to go again at this sort of time to be mindful of educators and those um, it's a little more outside of the regular work day just so that they can be attended. And it's going to be all on school garden successes in the summer. Um, because that, like Luke started to allude to, can be hard with water and help from people. And so we're gonna hear some different successes of what to use or how to use your school garden in the summer. Seeing lots of yays on this. So, <laughs> good. Um, I guess we'll just maybe open up for one minute in case anyone wants to pop on Luke before we, we close it all down. If anyone has any other questions, feel free to unmute yourself or add them to this and we would love to answer them, but if not, you guys are awesome. Thanks for joining us. And we'll be here for the next few minutes in case there are some. Yeah, and I just had to have to say I had a little brain fart back there in the herb section. And oregano is actually a perennial. I don't know why I got oh, confused weird. about that. Just, you know, <laughs> things happen. <laughs> it's, the, it's the teacher life. <laughs> oh, and of course, it was bugging me the whole time I was going through the rest of the slides. <laughs> I thought so because I've grown oregano and it always yeah. comes back. It comes I, back. It is a perennial. <laughs> maybe I just have really special oregano. It's funny. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, we're still here if you have any questions, but otherwise, feel free to pop off. And we appreciate so we appreciate you all so much for joining, and we look forward to you coming to the March one if you want to learn more about summer garden successes. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.